Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com. Now, hopefully you have a fundamental grasp of lenses because today we're going to dive into the depths of depth of field and how sensor size plays into this often confusing subject. If you remember back to our course on optics and the science of lenses, you recall that even the most basic lens will create a sharp image at some point if the object is more than one focal length away from the lens. Well, a photography lens has the same properties, except a photography lens has to produce that image on a camera's sensor. To do so, the lens inside shipped about changing the rear nodal point ever so slightly to achieve a sharp image on the lens. The distance which an object is in focus is marked on the lens, usually in both feet and meters. So that's our focus. But now the question is, how close do we have to be so the focus is good enough? If the lens says the object is 10 feet away is in focus, will something that's 11 feet away be acceptably in focus? And that's basically what depth of field is. How much space do we have on the near and far side of the plane of focus where things are acceptably sharp? A deep depth of field means there's a lot of space in front and behind the focal plane. A shallow depth of field means there's very little space. Now notice how we said acceptably sharp. We'll cover that more deeply in a bit. Also note that the terminology is depth of field, not depth of focus. Depth of focus refers to the space you have to move behind the lens. Unless you're working with camera with back focus setting, you will not be using depth of focus. Now, before we get really deep, let's talk about a key controller of depth of field, the aperture. A lot has been written and said about depth of field using graphics and charts, and that's fine. But I really wanted to see the physics of this happening in front of my own eyes. I set up a simple optics experiment using a single element lens, a magnifying glass with a focal length of 130 millimeters. Here we can see it projects the light from a bare bulb onto this piece of paper. When the light bulb is 20 inches to the lens, we have a sharp image on the paper. I know I'm mixing metric and imperial units, but that's just how my mind works. We'll be talking about inches and feet when discussing distance, but the lenses will be marked in metric. Now, as my assistant moves that light bulb closer to the lens, the image becomes blurred. At 17 inches the lens, uh, from the lens, it looks completely out of focus. When we pull the light bulb back to 23 inches, again, goes out of focus. This gives us a six inch depth of field, three inches in front of the focal plane at 20 inches and three inches behind. Now, watch what happens when we put an aperture in front of the lens. Now, these apertures were just tennis ball can lids that I punched a hole through. Now, recall that the f-stop is just the focal length divided by the diameter of the aperture. So, with the lens having a focal length of 130 millimeters, this first aperture having a diameter of 14 millimeters, this aperture is around f9. Now, using this aperture, we find that our near boundary is 16 inches and our far is 30 inches for a new depth of field of 14 inches, much, much bigger. By making the aperture smaller, we have increased our depth of field. Now, while we're here, there's one more point to be made about depth of field. That the closer you are to the lens, the shallower the depth of field will be. Now, this works pretty much the same regardless of the focal length or aperture. To demonstrate, I first positioned the bulb 12 inches from the lens and adjusted the paper behind the lens to create a sharp image. The near distance was 10 inches, with the far distance being 16 inches, giving us a depth of field of 6 inches using that same f9 aperture. Now, without changing the aperture, I refocused the light bulb now at 19 inches. The near was 16 and the far was 25, giving us a depth of nine inches. Now, if you think back to our thin lens equation, one divided by the distance of the object plus one divided by the distance of the image equals one of the focal length, you can kind of understand this intuitively. As the distance of the object gets bigger to infinity, one over the distance, the inverse, gets smaller, going all the way to zero, so that the image distance ends up being the same as the focal length. 
Now, as you move that object closer, the image distance retreats from the focal length at first very slowly, but then takes off to infinity the closer the distance the object approaches the focal length. But that math is just in regards to the focal plane, what's in focus. We're talking about depth of field, which brings us to the question we've been kind of dancing around this whole time. How sharp is sharp enough? When doing those experiments with the light bulb, I just eyeballed what I thought was sharp enough. Now, mathematically speaking, there's only one point in space where the image is perfectly sharp. But our eyes and our recording medium have some leeway, and that leeway is called the circle of confusion. Now let's imagine a single point of light as it travels through a lens. When the single point of light is emanating from the plane of focus, it will hit the sensor as a single point of light, creating this cone. Now, as the light moves forward and backward in and out of the focal plane, the cone will shift in space, no longer being a single point of light on that image sensor, but now a spot of light. The question is how big can that spot of light be before it becomes noticeable as a blur? And that's where the circle of confusion comes in. The circle of confusion is the maximum size that spot of light can be to be indistinguishable from a single point to the final viewer. Bigger than the circle of confusion and we see a blur. Smaller and we see what looks like a focused single dot. Now this for the most part is subjective. Photographers assume the image will be viewed as an 8x10 print at a comfortable distance, yielding about a 0 0.029 millimeter for a full frame 35 millimeter sensor and half of that APS for, for the APS-C sensor with a 0 0.018 millimeters. Those are the size of the circle of confusion. Now, cinematographers projecting film onto a big screen use a slightly different set of numbers. The ASC manual puts the circle of confusion of a 35 millimeter film print, which is about, about the same size as an APS-C sensor, at 1 1,000th of an inch or 0 0.025 millimeters, and 5 10 thousandths of an inch for, or uh, 0 0.013 millimeters for 16 millimeter film. This number can be plugged into this nasty equation to derive depth of field charts. But those numbers are for celluloid film, which has incredibly high resolution. In the digital world, the sensor is sectioned off into pixels, and these pixels put a limit on the size of our circle of confusion. And if you're still a little confused by the whole circle of confusion thing, this little light experiment might clear things up a bit. Going back to our basic single element lens, I replaced the light bulb with a flashlight. Now imagine the grid on this piece of paper to be the pixels on the camera sensor. If the light cone falls inside one pixel box, that pixel will activate. It doesn't matter how small the light cone is, there's no way to capture anything smaller than a single pixel. So in essence, the width of one pixel is our circle of confusion. Here, the light is focused at 18 inches. As I move the flashlight forward, the light cone gets bigger and starts to spill over to the pixels around it. Now we're going to get a blur. The close is somewhere around 11 inches and the far is 30 inches, which gives us a depth of field using this sensor pixel size of about 19 inches. Now, watch what happens as we reduce the size of the pixel, thereby reducing the circle of confusion. Our focus is still at 18 inches, but our near is only 13 inches and our far is 21 inches, giving us an eight inch depth of field. Going even tighter with the pixel grid, we get a near of 14 inches and a far of 19 inches, giving us a five inch depth of field. So as we increase the resolution, we are going to make the depth of field shallower. This may actually be rather intuitive. It's really hard to see what's in focus when you're looking at a tiny viewfinder. But once you blow up your image to the big screen, you can see all those focusing problems. But there's one more takeaway. Imagine we're shooting an HD image, 1920 by 1080. 
as we step down the sensor size from full frame to APS-C, which is closer to Super 35, and even down to Micro Four Thirds, which is about half of that of full frame, our depth of field actually gets shallower. Now, let me repeat that because it's a big point. Given identical lenses and apertures, the smaller sensor with its smaller circle of confusion will create a shallower depth of field. Smaller sensors have shallower depth of field. Do you hear that? That's a sound of camera nerds all over the world taking to their keyboards to tell me I'm flat out wrong. But the physics of light don't lie. And we're not done yet. There's still a matter of crop factor and lens equivalency. Although it's true that depth of field gets shallower with smaller sensors, there is a bigger factor involved and that's crop factor. Basically, a smaller sensor will create a more zoomed in image given identical focal length. And now we're going to get into a topic which I loathe because it creates so much unnecessary confusion. That's lens equivalency. In the photography world, 35 millimeter film was the standard that pretty much everyone from hobbyists to professionals shot on. People got used to what a 50 millimeter lens looked like on a 35 millimeter film camera. When digital came along with smaller sensors, they introduced the idea of lens equivalency, where you take the crop factor and multiply it with the lens focal length. A camera with an APS-C sensor, which has a crop factor of 1.6, shooting a 50 millimeter would give the same angle of view of an 80 millimeter lens on a full frame sensor. Same field of view, but not the same depth of field given identical settings. But I am getting ahead of myself. Let's do a demonstration. Here we have a full frame camera, the Canon 5D Mark II, shooting a scene using a 50 millimeter lens from a distance of 42 inches. We are shooting with ISO 500 and the lens is stopped to f2.0. Here is the resulting image. Let's measure the depth of field using a focus chart. We find that the near is about 41 inches and the far is about 43 inches, a really shallow two inch depth of field. Now, we'll replace that 5D with an APS-C sensor of the Canon 7D using the same 50 millimeter lens and shooting the same distance, the same ISO and aperture settings. Here is the resulting image. Before we do anything, let's measure the depth of field using our focus chart. Again, we find the near to be about 41 inches and the far to be about 43 inches. Now this is about the same as the full frame. Depth of field calculators show the difference between full frame and APS-C is really only a matter of half an inch or so. The depth of field of the full frame to be about two inches, whereas the crop factor be 1.3 inches. It's, st it's still a significant amount, but not that much when we're actually in practice. But the elephant in the room is look at that field of view. Notice how it's so much smaller with the smaller sensor. So in order to create that same field of view, the same look on the APS-C on the full frame, we have to use a longer lens on the full frame. Keeping the exact same distance, here's that 80 millimeter lens on the full frame sensor, shooting at the same aperture of f2.0. But look at that bouquet of the out of focus lights in the background. They're different, bigger on the 80 millimeter f2. That's because if we use the crop factor on the focal length, we have to use it on the f-stop as well because after all, f-stop is the focal length divided by the diameter of the aperture. So now we get an 80 millimeter shooting at f3.2 or thereabouts, which is the crop factor times our original f-stop. But now you'll notice that the image is darker. So we have to increase the ISO by, you guessed it, the crop factor. So in order to get a full frame equivalent on a 50 millimeter F2 and ISO 500 on an APS-C sensor, we need to shoot an 80 millimeter F3.2 ISO 800 on the full frame. So if the lenses are identical and the distance is the same, the smaller sensor will have a slightly shallower depth of field, but the field of view will be totally different. Using lens equivalency, the smaller sensor is shooting the equivalent of a higher focal length on its full frame brethren, but also a deeper depth of field because the full frame camera has to stop down. That's just one way of looking at it. 
but let's look at it the way most people would shoot. Going back to our original 50 millimeter image on the full frame sensor, how far back would we have to move that APS-C camera in order to create the same field of view? Well, the answer, the distance times the crop factor. So 42 times 1.6 yields 67.5 inches. Here is the resulting image. Again, notice how the bloom of the bouquet is smaller than it was before, but now it matches the bloom of the full frame sensor. By adding distance between the lens and the subject, we are increasing our depth of field, just as we demonstrated with the single lens experiment earlier. So because of the crop factor, the smaller sensor will inherently have deeper focus when creating similar field of views, even though the sensor has a smaller circle of confusion. If we carry this to the extreme, this is why your cell phone camera with its micro sensor can't produce the same kind of creamy, shallow depth of field images that a full frame camera can. Does that make these smaller sensors inferior? No, of course not. It just makes them different. Full frame sensors have a particular look and smaller sensors have another look. That's all it is. So through some demonstrations of physics using single lenses and cameras with different sensors, I hope we have dispelled some of the confusion surrounding depth of field. It still takes some doing to wrap my mind around it, but you've seen it right there in front of you. Now, will you find yourself in a position where you need to shoot identical fields of view using two different size sensors, where you'll need to do lens equivalency equations? Probably not. For most people, you'll just need to get used to whatever system you're using. If you're shooting with Super 35 APS-C size sensor, get familiar with what depth of field and field of view you get with your focal lengths. Don't worry so much about what the full frame equivalency is. It's really only necessary when you're jumping between formats. And then if you need to do the math, don't forget to multiply the crop factor into the focal length as well. The tools are important, but not as important as mastery of how to use them and how they function. This is the key to making something great. I'm John Hess, and I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.